Great, now we are already live with uh, session nine of this last day of the SDG Learning Center. Thank you everybody for joining. And to our panelists, I now pass the floor to Elena Proden, who will moderate this session. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished participants, and welcome to this session on innovative tools for target setting, peer learning, policy dialogue on SDG core and uh, SDG competencies. Uh, we are very pleased to, hear, uh, to have you here with us today. And our today's session will consist of four segments. The first segment will be led by UNESCO and it will focus on uh, monitoring target setting for SDG four, but also peer learning and policy dialogue. Uh, after that, we will have a segment led by the Ministry of Education and Science uh, of the Kyrgyz Republic with a focus on the integration of planetary health into educational systems. Uh, the subsequent segment will be led by the Leeds Beckett University and it will focus on the green IT education uh, featuring two innovative initiatives. And finally, we'll, we'll conclude with a segment led by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, which I'm representing uh, today. And uh, this segment will feature SDG fitness tests created by UN SDG Learn Partnership. Uh, and we will have an overall questions and answer session at the end. Um, we would like to invite you while uh, uh, our panelists um, make presentations, please use the questions and answers box. If you slide over the screen, you will see it on the bottom of the screen, Q&A session, and type your questions in there. This way we will be able to collect them and uh, the panelists to whom they are addressed answer your questions. Please mention the partner uh, and the name of the person to to whom you are addressing the question. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over um, the floor to Kate Redmond, Senior Communications and Advocacy Specialist from UNESCO, who will uh, moderate the first segment. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. A uh, big welcome to everyone today. As Elena said, um, I am the Senior Communications and Advocacy Specialist at the Global Education Monitoring Report, otherwise known as GEM Report, uh, at the UNESCO headquarters here in Paris. Um, a big thank you um, should be said right from the start to our colleagues at UNDESA, DSDG and UNITAR for your support in convening these sessions. We think this is a fantastic initiative. Um, there are so many tools and products out there and it's very important that we make sure everyone's got the skills and um, the understanding to be able to make use of them. Um, so we're very pleased to be kicking off this morning's session on SDG4, our global education goal. Um, this is a special year for the GEM report. It's our 20th anniversary. And we thought what better way to introduce what we do and some of our online tools than showing you a quick uh, video. And after that, I'll hand you over to my colleague who's Anna Dadio, she's the senior policy analyst who's going to talk you through four tools that we want to concentrate on today. They're online, they're global public goods, and they're there to support people like you uh, with finding the information you need on SDG4. Um, so we'll start the video now and then um, we'll come back. Thank you. The Global Education Monitoring Report was born 20 years ago. In 2015, it received an official mandate to monitor countries' progress towards the education goal in the 2030 Agenda, SDG 4. Published by UNESCO, the report has two defining features. First, it mobilizes its own resources. Second, the report is editorially independent. This means it is not beholden to the interests of any country organization, agenda, or group. It holds all actors to account for their commitments to SDG 4. It aims to be the main resource for decision makers on inclusive and equitable quality education. It has produced one global report almost every year since 2002. It believes that, by producing rigorous evidence 
data, and recommendations, it will improve policy dialogue and peer learning, and will strengthen education systems to help achieve SDG 4. But the GEM report is so much more than just one annual publication. It produces regional reports, gender reports, reports written with and for youth, and policy papers on specific issues. These are published in multiple languages. From conception to publication, one report takes 18 months. Hundreds of thousands engage with the findings when they are published via events, videos, animations, blogs, and the media. Multiple partners are involved. For instance, for its regional report series, including a new spotlight report on foundational literacy and numeracy in Africa, for research on education finance, to monitor the G7 global objectives on girls' education, and on the results report of the Global Partnership for Education. Four websites inform education action around the world. PEER compiles national profiles of education laws and policies to help countries learn from each other. SCOPE provides interactive narratives of the main issues in SDG 4. VIEW compiles multiple data sources to estimate out-of-school and completion rate trends. WIDE visualizes education inequality between and within countries. These last two activities are part of a strong partnership with the UNESCO Institute for Statistics that extends to helping countries set national SDG 4 benchmarks. These multiple outputs are extensively used for policy, but also for advocacy. The 2011 report turned the world's attention to education in conflict. It led to a new UN resolution recognizing attacks on schools as human rights violations. The 2013-14 report made the strongest case for a standalone education goal and emphasized the need to put learning at the heart of the SDGs. The 2020 GEM report fed into legal debates in Brazil and Spain to prevent children with disabilities from being segregated into different classrooms. GEM report estimates of the finance gap for education have driven donor contributions. These estimates have fed into multiple education financing campaigns around the world. There is much to celebrate from the past 20 years. Support the report and help strengthen its voice for change. So uh, now we've finished the quick introduction. I think uh, no further ado, I'll hand you to my colleague, Anna Cristina Dadio, who can talk you through those four websites that you saw mentioned there in the video. Thanks, over to you, Anna. Thanks a lot, Kate. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I hope so. Um, and um, welcome to everyone uh, to this presentation. I will uh, show the screen and I hope that you will be able to see it. Uh, so, as you as you already have heard, our GEM report, the Global Education Monitoring Report, is much more than one single report. Um, and uh, have you seen in the in the one minute presentation that Kate introduced? Uh, you have already had an overview of the different products. And what I will do in my presentation is uh, to go through the four websites. Um, that are noted on these uh, slides. So peer, scope, view, and uh, wide. I will start with peer. Um, the peer are profile enhancing education reviews, and um, they were launched in June 2020. And their main aim is to describe all countries' law and policies on key themes in education, so has to improve uh, evidence base on the implementation um, of national education strategies. And uh, another very important key objective of the profile is to foster peer learning and policy dialogue at sub-regional, regional, and international levels. The profiles uh, in a nutshell are linked uh, um, to a team, to the team of the Global Education Monitoring Report and uh, are uh, primarily prepared in-house uh, through desk review. Uh, so at the GEM uh, 
support uh, team. And the, but uh, they are also complemented by commission research uh, to have some national example for selected countries with complex institutional structure, for example, big uh, federal countries. And for all profiles on the website, when they are drafted, uh, countries are invited through their UNESCO delegations to review and update the information. And when this step of the process is complete, it is indicated on the website, um, on the relevant page of the country's profile with a blue tick. And you can see here the website uh, that is education.profile.org. The profiles uh, until now uh, cover four chapters. The first, uh, when we launched in June 2020, was about inclusion in education. That was the theme of the 2020 GEN report. And uh, we did that with an 168 country profiles. The, the second chapter covers equitable finance, and they were made available in January 2021. And they were also analyzed in a policy paper and with about 80 profiles. The third chapter is, uh, that are, is already published covers climate change, communication and education um, and is the result of a partnership with uh, the MISTI project at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. And the first 20 profiles were released in November 2021 during the COP26 and they will be followed by another 30 profiles to be released at COP27 in 2022. The fourth chapter has been uh, released uh, when we launched the GEM report 2021-22 in December 2021. Um, it covers provision and regulation of non-state actors in education. That was the theme of the uh, GEM report 2021-22. And it has in it 211 profiles. There are other chapters that are coming. Uh, one is... Uh, mm, covering sexuality education and the other one will cover technology in education that is the theme of the 2023 global education monitoring report moving to scope um, scope is uh, uh, was launched in uh, uh, january 2020 and uh, showcases indicator trends and patterns in global progress towards the un global education goal sdg4 and uh, the scope uh, website is available in uh, seven, seven major languages and uh, the site brings together data from various producers to explore the progress uh, that have been made and are made every day towards SDG4. Uh, it's visualizations. It's uh, very interesting because it enables users to look at different countries, regions, and educational levels to cover uh, to uncover new ways of thinking about education progress around the world. And what is very important about Scope is that it complements uh, the information that is provided in the printed version of the Global Education Monitoring Report that uh, is, as Kate was mentioning before, the tool of the international community for the follow-up and review of progress towards our education goal, SDG4. Um, the SCOPE website uh, shows uh, the progress that being made by each country, as well the bottlenecks and policy priorities from now until the 13 five key teams with about six interactive visualizations that are designed for each of these five key teams that are access, equity, learning, quality, and finance. It's uh, important to note that uh, the Global Education Monitoring Report has been producing a lot of printed products, as you may have seen in the one minute uh, short video, and uh, it has done that since the start of the century. But uh, very often it's really hard uh, to tell the full depth of story in a static figure. Um, and uh, interactive visual data driven graphics such as this one that you can see here enable visitors to choose what they want to focus on from the data set and to take multiple different stories from the data as they explore the website, they explore the team, and they explore the country they are interested in. And 
um, the, the website provides, in fact, a narrative and allows far more spaces for the user to digest and explore the information than is, posi is possible in any offline product. And we design these graphs to highlight issues that uh, may or are often uh, unnoticed, but they are nevertheless critical to achieve a success in SDG4. And user can uh, choose the country they want to look at based on the area of interest and or can scroll through uh, the different topic to see the countries uh, we have selected as demonstrating the variety of rates of uh, progress on different issues of, around the world. And uh, in addition, uh, apart from a better visual display, the site provides just enough detail on uh, first uh, viewing to draw visitors in, but allows for enough depth in the user functions that they can delve as far as they want into the data set. And uh, they can uh, also go until downloading the raw data to play with them uh, afterwards. Um, so this uh, scope website is really a teaching tool. It is a living rather than a static tool and is an advocacy tool. And the next update is due this November. The next uh, video, uh, the next uh, slides is about uh, view. Uh, that is the visualizing indicators of education for the world. The website was launched in December 2021, and this website has two main aims. The first is to visualize estimates of, of two flagship SDG4 indicators that are the completion rate and the out-of-school rate. The latter that is in partnership with the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. Um, the estimation method that is used mirror efforts that were previously used to estimate flagship health indicators and involve the use of multiple and diverse sources. The second aim is to familiarize users, especially at the country level, with the idea that an estimation model can help understanding long-term trends. And also, um, a, collaborative, a collaborative project between the JAMA report and the UIS, so the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, is underway to also estimate the out-of-school rate. The approach that is being used for this project integrates um, household survey data on attendance with uh, administrative data on enrollment and UN population estimates. And of course, as you can imagine and you can hear from what I'm saying, the aim is uh, to triangulate sources, to fill the gaps uh, and to develop a current time series. The out-of-school model estimates are scheduled to be added to the VIEW website by September. Uh, finally, the World uh, Inequality Database on Education was originally launched in 2010 with uh, new features that were, however, added in 2021. And um, this website is really important because it, it allows to highlight the powerful influence of circumstances such as wealth, gender, ethnicity, and location over which uh, uh, people have little control, but uh, which play a very important fundamental role in shaping the opportunities for education and life. Um, what the Y uh, does uh, is that it brings together, together data from different sources again, from the Demographic and Health Survey, um, the DHS, the Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, the MIX uh, data set, other national household service and learn assessment from over 160 countries. And this site is designed to draw attention to an acceptable level of education inequality across countries and between groups within countries with the aim of helping to inform policy design and public debate. Anna, just uh, to yes. say we've got, we've got one minute left on this. And I am, and I am done. I am done because uh, uh, I, I just wanted to show uh, that uh, um, this uh, website on wide uh, can be used by users to compare education outcomes between countries. And um, 
uh, education outcomes are shown uh, by rich and poor, by girls and boys, rural or urban, and uh, it allows to visualize uh, um, how wide these advantage can grow when they intersect. And uh, it's important also for the aim of the session today uh, to highlight that visitors can create maps, charts, infographics, and tables from the data. So um, I'm stopping here uh, with a question uh, for, for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Anna. Sorry for the tight timing. It's a, it's a short event, but um, the website addresses have been posted in the chat. And I hope you can um, all go and have a look at the websites afterwards. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome a close GEM report partner, uh, Luis Eduardo Perez Mosia, who is research manager at the Global Campaign for Education. And we hope, Louis, that you might be able to give people an idea of how you might have used some of these tools in uh, your work on advocacy, perhaps at different levels, national and global, um, just to give an idea of how they can be, um, how they can support many people's different types of work on SDG4. Uh, hi everyone, thank you Kay for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to join this conversation and congratulations on the 20th anniversary and all the work done by the team to develop these very useful online tools. Well, regarding your question, uh, I would say that there are many, many ways in which these tools can inform global, regional, and national research and advocacy. But because of the time constraints, I am going just to share maybe three of them. The very first one is that these tools provide data uh, to develop our national coalitions, high-level political forum, country reports on sustainable development goal four. As you all may be aware, uh, governments and states are invited by the UN to uh, submit the so-called voluntary national reports every year. And our members are very keen every year as well to submit what we call a spotlight reports. So information on laws and policies inform research and advocacy at the national level. GCE, uh, the Global Campaign for Education, use these resources, these tools for training purposes with our members and encourage them to use the data to draft their reports. These reports then are used at the, at the national level for advocacy purposes, for example, to encourage their governments to commit to sustainable development goal four and to protect everyone's rights to education. And at the same time, they are presented at the high level political forum. Incidentally, today, at the very same time, our members are presenting their spotlight reports at the high level political forum. So this is very, very useful. Thank you very much indeed. And the second key activity in which we use these tools is what we call uh, the Education Financing Observatory. Anna had mentioned uh, in her presentation the important work uh, UNESCO has been done for, for um, in getting information about financing education. And our campaign is developing a project that we call Education Financing Observatory, which briefly aims to examine the extent to which countries are using the maximum of the resources available to protect and fulfill everyone's right to education. So these tools provide us uh, with comparable and reliable data to see the extent governments are really putting money to making education available, accessible, acceptable, and adaptable. Uh, in this sense, uh, this uh, data is really valuable for our national members to draw on this information to get a clear picture of what is happening in the real context and how they can move forward to encourage the governments and other members of the society to advocate and campaign for the right to education. Uh, at this particular time of the year, we are, for example, using data for Honduras, Georgia, Somalia, and Tanzania, as we are drafting the what we call the pilot of the observatory. And we will be more than happy to share the information and the reports at the end of this year. 
And maybe I have kind of a minute left. I want to tell you that uh, we also use this information and we will definitely still uh, continue using this information for an activity that is so important for our movement is the so-called Global Action Week. So every year we organize the Global Action Week with all our partners and members. And depending on the topic, we use a bit of the information, bits of legislation, all the tools you have provided for developing many things, what we call the toolkit for the Global Action Week. This includes concept notes, trying to understand what is happening in different corners of the world, and what are the challenges that people are facing to really enjoy the right to education. And at the same time, we use this material to feed our campaigns. This year, for example, we are working on a campaign that is focused on education in emergencies, and we have been using all these tools to get information about what happened with people living in emergency situations. I mean, people living in refugee camps, people internally displaced, people looking uh, searching for asylum, people living, for example, in on their emergencies because of the climate change and all this stuff. So every year we are really needing for information, reliable, comparable, and these tools are, of course, a significant source of information to get our reports. And what is more important, to encourage governments at the local level with evidence to see this is what is happening, this is what we need to do, that is the investment we need to do as a whole, as a society, to protect everyone's rights to education. So thank you, UNESCO, for putting all these uh, wonderful uh, tools uh, together in the system in different language because it really makes uh, them accessible for many people. Thank you very much indeed. A big thank you to Louis Eduardo and to Anna Dadio. I, I think we're, we're out of time, but um, if I can make one last point, it would just be that uh, we do value everybody's feedback uh, on the relevance and design um, utility of these tools, but also you know, any questions you have or if there's a way that we can um, set up a longer type of workshop uh, on any of these tools um, with your specific organization or just with you as an individual, then please do reach out. Uh, my colleague, I think, is going to put some ways that you can stay in touch or email us after this. Um, a big thank you to everyone for taking part. Good luck for the rest of the session. Um, I think this is a, a, a brilliant, a brilliant, uh, brilliant initiative. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kate, and thank you all. So thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We will now move to the second segment of the session, uh, led by the Ministry of Education and Science of the Kyrgyz Republic, and I will pass on the floor to Emin Sogutkaktas. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Elena, for the introduction. Um, uh, I would like to thank UNITAR and UNDESA, the Ministry of Education and Science of the Kyrgyz Republic, and the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, Sunway University, Malaysia, for their roles in the organization of this uh, subsession. And thank you to our speakers here today, uh, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud from uh, Malaysia and uh, Honorable Minister Dr. Beishan Aliyah from the Kyrgyz Republic. So planetary health is a field that uh, is concerned with addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural systems and the effects of this on the human health and the well-being of all life on Earth. It is one of the topics that is at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. It ties together many different fields that are a part of the 2030 agenda, including uh, everything from agriculture to gender equality, from racial justice to quality education. And because of it tying together so many different topics, it will also greatly ease the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is especially important in today's world because of uh, its critical role that it could play in uh, the prevention and the fight against pandemics. Um, today, we are holding this session to talk about the integration of planetary health into education systems. 
And the teaching of planetary health to youth and young people is especially important because uh, it is a critical um, skill and knowledge uh, base to have uh, for youth in order to ensure the health of our planet and of humanity in the years to come. Uh, our two speakers today will discuss the importance of planetary health on uh, planetary health education on uh, the post-COVID world and how it could be, uh, how this integration process could be facilitated. Now I would like to provide a brief uh, bio of Dr. Mahmoud. Um, Professor Tan Sri, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud is a medical professional with more than two decades of experience managing crises in health. Uh, established, uh, she has established the Sunway Center for Planetary Health at Sunway University in Malaysia and is a professor and the executive director of this program. Uh, she is also currently a member of the Malaysian Climate Action Council and Consultative Council for Foreign Policy and a senior fellow of the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Dr. Mahmoud is also the Pro-Chancellor of Harriet Watt University, Malaysia. She's a strong advocate of planetary health and sustainability and actively advises on environment, social and governance in the board roles she holds. She was a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia on Public Health and a member of the Government of Malaysia's Economic Action Council from April 2020 to September 2021. Previous appointments include the Undersecretary General for Partnerships at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Chief of the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat at the United Nations, and Chief of the Humanitarian Response Branch at UNFPA. She is the founder of Mercy Malaysia, a Southern-based international humanitarian organization. Dr. Mahmoud is currently on the board of the Employees Provident Fund of Malaysia, National University of Malaysia, CVS Foundation, and Alam Foundation in Malaysia, and joined the board of Roche in Switzerland in March 2022. She is also the chair of the Syrian Pitsuan Foundation based in Singapore. She is a recipient of numerous national and international awards, including the most prestigious Malaysian Merdeka Award in 2015 and the ASEAN Prize in 2019 for her contribution to peace, community development, and humanitarian work. She also received the inaugural ESA Award for Humanity in 2013. Dr. Mahmoud graduated as a Doctor of Medicine, has a Master's in Obstetric and Gynecology, and is a Fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, United Kingdom. She also completed Executive Education at the International Management and Development Center, IMD at Lausanne. Uh, Tansri, Dr. Mahmoud, why is planetary health important for building back better from the COVID-19 pandemic, and how can it help prevent future pandemics? Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much, Emin, for that very long introduction. Uh, it's a very, it's a great pleasure to be here, and congratulations for really uh, taking this effort to include planetary health in the discussions. I think all of us are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, which are so important and has uh, eight years to go, uh, and then we were hit by the pandemic. Now, for all of us in the health profession and in the uh, humanitarian and development world, we all saw that the question of another pandemic was a question of when and not if. Uh, we had all the telltale signs, we had previous uh, in, um, outbreaks and uh, epidemics, and we knew the big one was coming, and then it came. But we have to realize that it didn't come out of the blue. And I think your description of planetary health is so accurate that it is about human behaviors that have caused a lot of destruction to the planet and the environment, and therefore created the imbalance for zoonotic leaks to happen, which means viruses jump from animal to animal and eventually to humans. So uh, the, the pandemic is a wake-up call to all of us uh, to take planetary health very seriously because human health can only thrive uh, in the presence of a planet that is healthy and human behaviors are driving the unhealthiness. So planetary health is a multi-sectoral approach, which is political, economic, uh, financial, um, social, as well as a health dynamics. So why is it so important? Because we can and must start uh, working towards preventing that next pandemic. So how does that you know, apply to the education sector? So I come now uh, bringing the experience of the Sunway University in Malaysia, which is a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a private university, but very much engaged with sustainability. Uh, we, also we are also home to the Jeff Sachs Center for Sustainable Development. 
When we introduce planetary health into the university, it has now become the foundation of all education, which means whether you're studying engineering or actuarial science, communications, culinary, biology, or biomedical sciences, every student and every professor and, and member of staff is expected to apply a planetary health lens in research, in teaching, in education. So how do we do this? Uh, first of all, we have developed something called a, uh, a module, a seven week module, which is planetary health for community service, where every student from 2024, will, it will be mandatory for them to complete the seven week course before they graduate. So it is a dynamic course. It is where you use your knowledge, whether it's economics, business or communications and understand what planetary health is and then use your knowledge, your area of specialty uh, and, and faculty to apply the planetary health knowledge in the everyday work that you do within your education realm, but also with community. Our hope is that uh, as we graduate more students who will become leaders in all sorts of fields, whether it's civil society or so, uh, civil service or politics or business or, or social enterprise or indeed academia, they will all realize that it is their individual actions that will actually determine whether we will have another pandemic in the future, whether we will have the climate crisis going out of control. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is why education is fundamental to shifting, you know, how we work, how we look at problems that we have. And while we want a short term view, we also need to have a longer term view of the challenges that we have. So we are hoping that, you know, by 2024, we are doing the pilots now, but from 2024, this will then be mandatory. Uh, and we want to make it open source so that every university, every teaching establishment can take what we have and then, you know, adapt it to your local and national needs. So in my seven minutes, I hope that I have covered the importance of ad adopting planetary health into education, so that we can hopefully prevent uh, future pandemics, but more importantly, look at the drivers of why we may not be able to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud for that very uh, insightful response. Um, so next uh, we are, um, going to uh, move on to uh, the Honorable Minister, Dr. Almazbek Beishan Aliyev. Um, Professor Dr. Almazbek Beishan Aliyev is the Minister of Education and Science of the Kyrgyz Republic. Prior to this, he was the permanent representative of the Kyrgyz Republic to the United Nations, the director of the Regional Institute of Central Asia and Bishkek, and the head of the Department of Education, Culture and Sport in the Office of Government of the Kyrgyz Republic. Honorable Minister Dr. Beishan Aliyev has an impressive academic record. In different periods of his career, he was a visiting fellow at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University, and a visiting professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Education. The Honorable Minister served as a Vice Director for Research, Development, and External Affairs at International Alatu University in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and prior to this as a Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at Vistula University in Warsaw, Poland. He's an author of more than 60 articles, books, and monographs in education, history, politics, and culture. Honorable Minister Dr. Beishan Aliyev holds a PhD in education from Arabayev Kyrgyz State University and another PhD in history from the same university. He also holds a master's degree in education from Ludwigsburg University of Education, Germany, and a bachelor's degree in English philosophy, philology from Narayan State University, Kyrgyzstan. Honorable Minister Dr. Beishan Aliyev, how can planetary health be effectively integrated into education systems around the world, particularly in least developed countries and the developing world? And why is this important in the post COVID-19 era? Uh, I, is the minister here? Uh, I believe the minister had some technological issues, so he's logging on right now. Sorry about the delay.
Honorable Minister Dr. Beishan Aliyev, um, uh, I'll repeat the question uh, for you. Um, how can planetary health be effectively integrated into education systems around the world, particularly in least developed countries and the developing world? And why is this important in the post-COVID-19 era? Um, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Beishan Aliyev, uh, did you log in using the link? Um, Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Beishan Aliyev. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Soktash. I'd like also to thank you, or you for your role in organizing this event. Special thanks to UNITAR and UNDESA, the SDG, for organizing the uh, 2022 high-level political form SDGs learning training and practice sessions. And thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for being and speaking here today. Planetary health has extreme relevance to the state of our world today. In addition to the health problems that have been caused by the terminal changes in environmental in the past few decades, we all experienced the immense effect that it had first hanged through the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the main reasons for the emergence of the novel coronavirus was the increase in the diversity and number of bats. This was caused by the loss of the bats' natural habitats, leading them to move closer to each other and towards areas more densely inhabited by humans. As a result, the risk that a person would come into contact with a coronavirus that would be dangerous for human health increased, and uh, this increased risk ended up getting resolved uh, through a zoonotic exchange, where the virus was transferred from the animal to the human. This led to the coronavirus pandemic as zoonotic diseases make up more than 60% of emerging infection events in the world. This increase in the conditions allowing for zoonosis is very dangerous and uh, stopping this trend is one of, of the most important steps that we can take in order to uh, prevent future pandemics. Uh, thus, planetary health is an especially important subject to teach in the post-COVID world as the world is emerging from a pandemic that has ravaged uh, the planet and whose enormous impacts have altered in the very way we live. Through educating future generations in planetary health and ensuring th that they gain awareness, we can secure the health of both our planet and humanity and avoid future pandemics. However, despite its critical importance, the state of planetary health education is lacking all over the world. In fact, even planetary health education in universities and colleges are far from cool. In recent years, there, was, uh, there has been greater awareness and interest about planetary health. However, a cohesive uh, framework to guide higher education institutions, teachers, and students was lacking. In response from 2019 to 2021, a task force formed by the Planetary Health Alliance worked on filling this need. As a result of this task force, the Planetary Health Education Framework was created. The Planetary Health Education Framework consists of five core aspects that were created to contain the primary knowledge, values, and practices ascribed by planetary health. They are uh, interconnection within nature, the anthropocene and health systems thinking and complexity, equity and justice and movement building and systems change. Through the provision of further details and instructions regarding each of these five domains, the framework provides a cohesive and comprehensive guide for institutions of higher education to shape their teaching around. But planetary health is a concept that young people should already be familiar with, uh, be, uh, with before they even reach the university level. Therefore, it's important to also teach planetary health at the secondary education level. The uh, 12 cross-cutting principles for planetary health education that were created by the Planetary Health Alliance are a guide to planetary health education at all education levels. Therefore, I'll buy um, not a specific guide to secondary level education regarding planetary health, as is the framework for higher level education. 
It's a set of principles that can guide creation of a standard curriculum for planetary health education. While time constraints, unfortunately, do not allow us to cover all of the 12 principles, they include the following points. First, a planetary health perspective. This involves the exploration of global challenges and the world through a planetary health lens and the equipment of students with the capability to do this throughout their lives. Second, urgency at scale. This involves the communication of the scale of environmental change caused by humans and scale of the impact of this environmental change of human uh, health, as well as the uh, urgency that is required in addressing planetary health challenges. Four, third one is uh, policy, and this principle is one of the development of an understanding of planetary health-oriented policies and practices that need to be implemented in order to ensure the protection of health of both environmental and humanity. Fourth one is organizing and movement building. This principle involves the provision of an understanding of the crucial role that is played by activism in communities and movement building in the political process. Specific, specifically uh, regarding planetary health. However, aside from such rare general guidelines, uh, guidelines uh, applicable for, to all education levels, there unfortunately are not many resources that have been created to guide teaching at institutions of secondary education. Therefore, this uh, creation of curricular guidelines uh, to lead the education of planetary health in all parts of the world is a necessary next step for planetary health uh, proponents and organizations. Planetary health education is especially important in the developing world because of many reasons. The effects of environmental change are and will be first most actually felt by the population in these areas of the world. Therefore, the advancement of planetary health education in developing countries needs to be supported. This can be done through governmental support regarding planetary health education and increased resources for educational institutions on planetary health. Hence, uh, more attention needs to be paid to planetary health education in the developing world by the international organizations. For instance, the planetary health education framework states that the two of the four biggest factors influencing planetary health education and the way it should and can be delivered is local socioeconomic, cultural and environmental conditions and local learning priorities. Both of these will have significant distinctions between the developed and developing world. Uh, therefore, the creation of a framework special, specifically addressing planetary health education in developing countries is an example of a step that can be taken to further planetary health education in developing countries. As uh, for our country, Kyrgyzstan is uh, committed to sustainable development through uh, the promotion of green economy priorities. For the Kyrgyz Republic, such a transition is an urgent need. Uh, as the socioeconomic development of the country is largely based on the consumption of natural resources. Recognizing the importance of transition, the Kyrgyz Republic has developed and approved the concept of green economy, Kyrgyzstan account of a green economy. Within the framework of the concept of green economy in the sphere of education, the ministry is working on uh, formation of ecological culture and careful attitude to biological species among population which includes development and introduction of programs on conservation and value of biodiversity into national education curricula related to the concept of education for sustainable development. Uh, raising public awareness about energy saving and renewable uh, energy sources, we plan to develop methodological materials for government and local self governmental officials and information materials for school children and students on energy saving making changes in the education programs for professionals and managers in the field of tourism and sustainable tourism and development of training manuals for uh, preschool teachers, school teachers, university teachers, vocational school, vocational training masters, training seminars for teachers of all of formal and non-formal education in the field of green economy. So last, increasing the role of environmental education and education for sustainable development by incorporating environmental education. Education for sustainable development and the green economy to existing legislation. Currently in the sphere of school education, Kyrgyzstan is to integrate the basis of green skills, STEM approaches and building an educational direction based 
on the principles of SDGs into the school subjects. The minister is launching a new subject standard, Me and the World, focused on gaining knowledge and understanding of the world around uh, us and gaining skills to safety, interact with the, and the world and uh, preserve nature. An important task of the minister in the cooperation with local authorities is to build new educational institution with low energy consumption and to re-equip the existing ones in accordance with the sanitary and epidemiological requirements of air and heat conditions, natural artificial lighting, water supply, sewage and uh, hygienic requirements. In constructing new buildings, construction Kyrgyzstan within its capabilities with, uh, will focus on reducing environmental and health impacts significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, garbage and um, polluted water, enhancing and protecting natural habitat and biodiversity, preserving natural conditions, creating more comfortable indoor air quality and conditions and reducing pollutants and turned water, soil and air. So thanks for listening for my presentation and I hope it has achieved its cause of communicating to you the critical importance of supporting and promoting plantar health education all over the world. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Honorable Minister, Dr. Beishanlio for that response. Um, so this concludes our brief session and thank you so much for listening. I believe we went uh, a couple of minutes over time. So Elena, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will now move to our third segment that will focus on world-class quality green IT education with first-hand experience in transnational uh, PERCOM and Genial Masters programs. And I'm going to hand over uh, the floor to Associate uh, Professor uh, Ahlian Kor. Uh, Associate Professor in Sustainable and Intelligent Computing from the Leeds Beckett University. Uh, she's also a leader of the University Sustainable IT Research Group. Uh, she's been leading on several um, EU and nationally funded uh, projects uh, as the LBU Principal Investigator. Um, and uh, her inter research interests um, include applied research relating to artificial intelligence, IT infrastructure, as well as data center energy efficiency and sustainability. Um, Dr. Ahlian Kor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alina, for the kind uh, introduction. And thank you to UNITAR for for having you know organized this really interesting and uh, advantageous kind of uh, event all right i will share my screen now okay so from current slide okay uh, my 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 panel uh, comprises uh, professor eric rondu uh, and also Professor John Philip Georges from University of Lorraine, France, and Professor Carl Anderson, uh, Associate Professor Solomon o Oyeler from Luleå University of Technology, Sweden. So this is the outline of our presentation. So I'll talk about the introduction to the two case studies of World Quality Green IT Education. And uh, Professor Eric uh, Rondu, We'll talk about how these case studies address the SDG 4 and also other SDGs. Uh, for Professor John Philip Georges, he will talk about the innovative uh, operational framework for a successful uh, global collaboration for PROCOM and also GENIAL. And for the impacts and uh, best uh, practices for PROCOM and GENIAL, will be presented by Associate Professor Solomon Oyeler and also Professor Carl Anderson. So uh, both PERCOM and GENIAL are uh, funded by the EU. So it's Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's uh, degrees. And for PERCOM, uh, it stands for Pervasive Computing and Communications for Sustainable Development. So it kind of like uh, really fits into the SDGs of the UN. And in actual fact, it is um, a pioneering um, 
joint postgraduate uh, provision, master's provision for green IT education in the whole of Europe. And uh, PERCOM, uh, you know, uh, ran from 2012 to 2019. And uh, all in all, we had five uh, cohorts of students from 39 students, uh, 39 countries. And the consortium comprises three full partners. Um, and 15 international associate partners. The coordinator is um, University of Lorraine, and this is the Facebook uh, link for PERCOM. Uh, as for um, GENIAL, it stands for Green Networking and Cloud Computing. So it's running from 2019 to 2025. So we have a few more years left. And uh, all in all, we are expecting four cohorts of uh, students and the Consortium comprises three full partners, uh, University of Lorraine, who is the coordinator, and Leeds Beckett University, and also Lulio University of Technology. And we have got 30 uh, international uh, associate partners. So the primary goals of uh, PERCOM basically is to promote environmental awareness. So this is linked to SDG 13 and also to equip ICT prof uh, professionals with green IT uh, related competencies, you know, so that we could build a more energy efficient, more resourceful and also greener kind of systems. And uh, for Genial, it kind of like echoes and reinforces whatever that uh, PERCOM has done. So basically it's also to train ICT professionals, equip them with green IT skills and competences, uh, competencies yeah, to design and implement um, sustainable ICT applications and services. So some of them, you know, like uh, especially the cutting edge kind of technologies relating to IoT, relating to the cloud and edge and so, so on and so forth. Now the success stories that I would like to share with uh, all of you is that the number of applications that we have received for Genial. For, so for cohort one, we had uh, 150 applicants in, and it increases to 450 applicants for cohort two. And for cohort three, we had uh, 717 applicants. So it shows that, um, you know, it, it kind of like arouses a lot of interest around the world, yeah, from people, uh, from students around the world. And for PERCOM, so far we have trained 88 ICT professionals. So uh, in pervasive computing and communication technologies and equipped with green IT skills. And in 2019, we conducted a survey on these uh, graduates. We find that 44% uh, of them are in academia. So including PhD study in Europe and then 40% in uh, green IT uh, uh, jobs, related jobs, 16% non-IT uh, jobs. And for um, Genial, so far we are training cohort one, so 19 students all in all. And for cohort two, we have got 21 students. So um, um, in, in, in universe, University of Lorraine, so they will pursue studies in green networking and for uh, green ICT and also smart ICT in uh, Leeds Packard University and green cloud computing in uh, uh, Lulio Technology University, and we are expecting to, you know, train 100 ICT professionals with green IT skills by 2025. And so I finished my part, and I would like to now stop share, and I would like to hand over to Professor Eric Rondo. Okay, thank you, Aliana. Uh, can you share the? You want me to share? Slide. Slide, okay. please. Thank you. So, so you want me to share this? Okay, so I'll go on to the next one. Okay, so you can. Okay. So, uh, my name is Eric Kondo, and my talk is based on my experience uh, as director of PERCOM Master Program. So, as mentioned by Alian, it was the first international master program to develop IT skills while considering the impact on the environment and society. So my presentation is organized along the following priority axes, uh, quality education, global warming, gender equality, and global partnerships. So I would like to start with uh, quality education in IT. 
So the quality education in IT must be reforged, I think, by, by centering uh, the student in the education system. This means that the student needs uh, to move from a process of accumulating knowledge to meet technical uh, requirements to a process uh, of applying this knowledge to improve the well being of people. This implies that the student must be able to explain the advantages, but also the negative impacts of his or her work and choices in a broad vision, taking into account people and the planet. The teaching must be organized around ecological concept based on cooperative win-win interactions rather than competitive win-lose ones. However, the cooperative model must be done while maintaining individual values so that everyone feels useful in our society. So the second part is about addressing global warming in IT. So in order to make these changes in IT education, the famous principle of Moore's laws must, be, must no longer be the main law governing the IT world. Of course, Moore's laws has enabled a fantastic and rapid development of the digital, digital world. It is also the cause of all excesses in the development of IT solutions. Moore's law accelerates, for example, the constant replacement of computer hardware, which results in the depletion of Earth's resources and the production of electronic waste. Moore's law has also resulted in underperforming software developments that will be compensated by increasingly powerful computing units. It is therefore necessary to rethink the training of, studi of students in an approach of digital solution that is both more simple, it means that that goes to the essentials of customer requirements, but also more complex in its optimality. To achieve this thing, it is important to equip students with tools that allow them to respond to optimization needs, but also to immerse them in a global vision that takes into account the whole life cycle of digital solutions. This life cycle must include the phases of extraction of resources from the air, the manufacture of equipment, its use and its demonstrating. The cooperative model then becomes relevant because the student cannot be an expert in all disciplines, but must be open to interact with other experts. This willingness to interact is a new expertise to be distilled to students with a view of to sustainability. Eco-design approaches based on biomimicry are ways to take. Now, an IT education without difference, the digital sector has a fundamental role to play in educating IT experts from all segments of the population, for example, men, women, different societal categories, different cultures, different countries, as these IT experts as have to respond to diverse needs adapted to the target populations. The Percom Master on Green IT has been an example in this field with students from all over the world, students with experts uh, with a different social background, as many female, as many female as male students. The gender mix can be explained by an educational program, not only focused on technology, but also with an ecological and social vision more attractive for women. This program offers cultural periods also, such as visit to museum, sport activities, cooking demonstration, etc., to immerse IT students in unfamiliar worlds and to have an open view of the world. Now, strengthening global partnership. So the cooperative model is the guideline for the more sustainable IT education. In the Percom Master courses, the hosting of students from different countries all over constructive exchanges during the courses, but also during collaborative projects where students share their personal experiences on the drawbacks on a, of, a, of a competitive world by pointing out, for example, the accumulation of waste in Africa countries that have become a trash of Western countries, the rising uh, waters in Asia rice field, pollution in mega city, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, the Master uh, Percom was also a platform where foreign researchers, international companies, such as Cisco, Orange, uh, Ericsson, Facebook, or uh, associations, such as uh, Ellen McCarthy Foundation addressing the circular economy, came to present specific problems and their original proposal for a more sustainable world. 
So that's conclude my presentation. So Alian, if you want to. Continue. Thank you very much, Professor Eric Rondu. So our next presenter would be Professor John Philip Georges. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. So just to go more in deep, I'm just going to, to explain some uh, concrete um, education we have there. Of course, it's just an example. And I just wanted to ask a question to, to come back about student. Uh, so the student we, that applied to our program have some computer science, engineering, and mathematics requirement. Uh, we are quite successful. We can see, well, we have students from all over the world. It's more than 30 nationalities, if I'm just taking uh, into account the two last quotes. And it's a very worldwide. We have, of course, from developed countries like USA or EU countries, but we have a, a student from Chile to Malaysia. And uh, I mean, for some of them, it's difficult to access this program, but we have managed to, for some of them to, to get the uh, status of refugee from the United Nations and, and even travel documents about it by the United Nations. So it's really nice. So not are in a good uh, place, uh, thankfully the, the scholarship uh, they can apply for the EU, but also from other government or, or companies, why not? Uh, it covers participation costs, uh, subsistence and travel. The point here, in addition to what uh, Eric Rondo said uh, earlier, uh, is that um, we, if you look at the program, it's a single track. Uh, I mean, uh, we, the student move all together, and you can see there is four semester. Of course, it's a master program, but it's mostly about technical. If you read uh, networking, uh, green and smart ICT and cloud computing, uh, because uh, it's a deliberate choice from the design uh, to not only have specific courses about sustainability, but uh, to mix the sustainable part into the technical courses because that's what we want. We want to, to, to go to have a new generation of engineers, researchers working in academy or in industry uh, that will be able to propose a uh, well solution. Uh, and when I say well solution, it's to take into account, uh, I mean, uh, sustainability in ICT, how to make mm -hmm. Uh, networks, software engineering, etc., more sustainable, but also how we can use ICT to, to make uh, smart cities, smart one for smart buildings. Uh, that's uh, really important. So you will find course about the three pillars about sustainability, environment, economics, and ethics inside each semester. That's uh, really something uh, we will have. It's our experience. And at least what we can see is that students are, are able to, to really propose new solutions. Uh, just to go more deep and go into the next slide, uh, I mean, uh, so you have the program, again, it's pretty the same. So, okay, the student move uh, into your HCU, but the point I want to stress, you will find again some technical courses uh, but uh, I can just illustrate some point is that for each lecture, you will find sustainable part. I mean, there was a lecture during semester one, which is mostly about network. And more generally speaking, if you look, the program is going from the wire to the cloud. So it cover all aspects about the ICT and it give a, a, a quite large experience to see how it change. But I mean, if you have quality of service and quality and sustainability is that we want to give them, um, uh, to give them um, metrics in order to get data. We, we spoke earlier about data, but to have really metrics to decide if we are going from the system part in the good direction or what. For the same, if you look here, so we have the same for sustainable computing and uh, cloud computing for the semester two and semester three. 
Um, but what I want also to point even student have an introduction to research, uh, whatever if it is with a company or with a, a university. And it's for the, uh, we have here more than 25 partners from uh, Chile, from Malaysia, from South Africa. So again, we have a lot of uh, partners that help us. So it's not specific to EU. And, but the master thesis, we, we, we started at the beginning of the program. Why? Because we want to let the student to get, uh, well, to integrate uh, in addition to information and communication technology, a uh, sustainable part. So that's uh, really important for us. And just to conclude, at the end of the program, the student year received three awards. Uh, it's a master of, uh, this is the next slide, but this is a, a master of complex system engineering, a master in information and technology, and master in computer science. Uh, with some specialist track for each of one, because um, the students still have the possibility to, to apply the student part in a specific area. And this part, I think my slot is over, so I will let the floor to, to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Professor John Philip Georges. So the next speaker is... Um, Professor Carl Anderson and also Associate Professor Solomon Oyelure. So would you like to share the screen? No, I think uh, you can help us continue to share the screen, Alien. Okay then, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present the impact and best practices for Pekan and Janelle. Uh, I will be leading the presentation while my colleague, uh, Professor Carl will lead the aspect of the question and answers. Right, so my presentation is broadly divided into two. So we are looking at the, uh, the impacts and best practices from within the academia and um, outside the academia. So for within the academia, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to create new cooperation in research activities. So the impact of PECAN and general program uh, is visible in the development of new, new research collaborations on the basis of equal commitment to the project and of shared interest. So the joint coordination uh, usually leads to frequent purposeful interactions, uh, running a program together also facilitates communication and creates contacts and occasions for discussions, uh, which usually result in uh, easier collaboration. Uh, secondly, there is an improved pedagogical practices and methodologies that uh, is uh, visible within uh, the general and the PECAN program. So through the mutual exchange of information, competencies and expertise, uh, the institutions within the project are uh, learning from one another to develop together uh, new and innovative approaches, uh, pedagogical practices, uh, excellent ways of working together and methodologies that are, that are more than an, uh, state of the arts. Thirdly, we have within the academia, the increase in the number of doctoral students, which actually are leading to academic career pathways for the doctoral students that are completing the PECAM program and the general program. Uh, for example, you've heard from my uh, colleagues that there is a good number of uh, PECAM students, at least 44% of them, that have enrolled in a PhD in one of the host, host uh, institutions. And already we are receiving news from the general Court one at the moment, uh, they are just about to complete their, their uh, master's program with us, and they are already receiving PhD offers across the academia and even with the industry sec uh, sector. So a joint kind of a PhD between the, the companies and the academia. This is possible. This is a, a clear impact that is being visible uh, for, for the program. 
So next is the acquisition of cutting edge and sustainability related uh, expertise. So the core topics of both Pecan and Janelle is entirely focused on the, uh, sustainability and green ICT. Uh, as a result, it is easier for institutions to acquire expertise and funding for cutting edge research in these uh, areas. Besides, uh, there is collaboration aspect which increases in terms of the administrative, the teaching and research. So we see a lot of uh, new networks, new partnership and collaborations uh, being obvious within the partners and beyond the partnership that we have at the moment. And then uh, lastly, within the academia, we see exchange of good practices. So participating in, uh, in the Erasmus Mundus PECON and general programs provides valuable knowledge of administrative procedures uh also evaluation criteria we can see we can learn from each other and other good practices examples that we can learn from each other within the partnership within the consortium and beyond this uh, constitute a, a, an asset in the development of new projects uh, new innovations and uh, interesting outcome for us uh, within the academia. But uh, look, looking at the impact of uh, our program outside the academia, we have three major areas that the impact is visible. We have the environmental impact, we have the people and the profit uh, aspect. So for example, uh, if you look at the environmental uh, impact, uh, both PECON and general programs support the EU uh, 2050 uh, low carbon economy action. Uh, besides, we also support the Smarter 2030 on ICT solution for 21st century challenges, which has been proposed by, by the EU and the proposal of uh, smart ICT systems, which consume, for example, less energy reduction in carbon footprint, uh, considering the use of renewable energy, taking into account the whole life cycle process uh, especially the recycling phase in the context of the circular economy. So this is quite important for the uh, environment. Uh, beside uh, the impact of both general and um, the PENCO program uh, is visible within people uh, in terms of upskilling and progression. Uh, for example, uh, we can see there is the impact is visible in the aspect of the fight against the uh, digital divide, particularly in poor countries. You can see uh, from uh, earlier speakers uh, within this presentation that we are actually recruiting students from across the globe. So, uh, so this is very, very important because you can you can see that uh, we provide the knowledge for students to be aware of climate change. Secondly, limiting of ICT labor shortages risk in the EU and increasing employment opportunities. So uh, by 2025, which is just three years to come, there could be more than 1 million on full on field vacancies for ICT. So uh, with this program, we are able to reduce this number drastically. Uh, for, for example, for instance, um, uh, last year, 10,000 new jobs were announced by Facebook Meta across EU to help build the, the metaverse. Uh, our students are actually going to be um, recruited in these areas as well. So uh, that is all the other aspects of the impact that we can visibly see in uh, the uh, people progress as part of the general program and the PECOM program. The aspect of profit, uh, the impact is so obvious. Uh, the supporting the new EU market in cloud computing, which is very, very important as uh, ICT infrastructures are going cloud-wise, uh, we could see the reduction in capital and operational costs for businesses. We could see the increase in quality of service quality of experience and quality of life of people across EU, but not only EU, but also across the world, basically. Thank you very much, uh, Alien. You can proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Solomon Oyelre. So if uh, any one of you has got any, uh, you know, questions, I would like to know more about the programs. Yeah, so you can, uh, this is our list of email addresses. So thank you very much. And over back to you, Elena. 
Thank you very much. And we will now uh, have the final segment that will focus on the SDG fitness test. And while we are putting up the slides, um, so I will just say a few introductory words as we proceed with this segment uh, that is led by UNITAR on behalf of UNSDG Leon. Um, before you, you see the demo of the SDG fitness test, uh, we would like to say a few words first about UNSDG Leon and also a little bit about uh, cross-cutting SDG competencies. Um, so um, UNSDG Leon is a partnership of more than 60 organizations, UN agencies and other organizations. And this partnership uh, provides a gateway to learning and training resources on SDGs um, that are delivered by uh, these organizations. Uh, many of these resources are free. And as you can see right now, there are um, more than 350 courses and also more than 200 micro learning resources available uh, through the gateway. Um, the gateway, uh, um, all, also uh, can be accessed uh, at the following um, web address uh, URL, www.unsdglearn.org. And so we would like uh, anyone interested uh, to come and visit the gateway. And it's a great resource that has been created uh, for learners around the world. Uh, so we hope it can be useful um, to uh, learners, no matter in which country you are situated. Um, then also very quickly on UNSDG Leon, um, we have uh, more than 169,000 uh, users um, today. Um, and we have both um, genders um, more or less well represented. And as you can see, we have uh, quite a few users uh, from the Asian region, Asian region, but also from the uh, Americas, European and African regions. Um, and finally, um, to say, uh, I would like also to add, and the next slide, please. Um, on the gateway, um, we use um, several taxonomies. So you can search in a search engine, uh, using um, keywords, you can search also by goal, by SDG, for example, if you are interested specifically in training on um, water, you could search by goal six. Uh, you can also search by cross-cutting topics, such as, for example, breaking the silos when it comes to intersectoral linkages or leave no one behind. Uh, we also have dedicated regional pages and uh, finally, uh, we've been also working to provide specific learning opportunities uh, to different uh, communities, professional communities. So uh, we've developed uh, several mental models, such as business person, community builder, policy maker, citizen, data person, project manager, communicator, educator, and thinker. So you can choose um, up to three profiles that you think fit your learning needs. And then you can get recommendations uh, in terms of learning based on these profiles. We are also developing a professional community landing pages. There is already one on statistics that is um, led by UN Statistics Division and Global Not Network of Institutes for Statistical Training. And as you can see, um, statisticians uh, interested in learning more on SDG indicators can go and uh, find relevant learning on this page. We are also right now working on the developing uh, SDG for business uh, page and evaluation page together with UN Evaluation Group. And basically, this is the partnership that uh, has created this SDG fitness test about which you will learn in a second. And as you can see, uh, there are also blogs uh, and podcasts that are available and that have been developed by UNSD Trillion partners. And I will now hand over uh, the floor uh, to our colleague from UNESCO, uh, Jun Morahashi, who is the um, acting chief of the section of education for sustainable development. 
Uh, and June will talk about uh, SDG cross-cutting competencies. Uh, June, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for the introduction. Uh, greetings from UNESCO headquarters, uh, which is based in Paris. I think, uh, Medina, we prepared one question to the audience, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Super. Um, I hope everyone is ready and time is running, but if ever you can, please go to this menti.com uh, and then please use this uh, code. And maybe we can already put the question. Medina, can you read it aloud, the question? If everyone is not able to connect to Menti, my suggestion is you could still put your answers in the chat box. Okay, so what is the most important capacity, according to you, uh, needed to advance sustainable development? What is the most important capacity needed to advance sustainable development? If you have any difficulties to connect to Menti, please just use this chat box, which is fine. Uh, your keywords, great. Magic collaboration. <laughs> Let us take maybe uh, 30 more seconds and please keep typing. Okay, good, good. So 20 more seconds and then I will start my, uh, my talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the word the collaboration is really in the middle, which is very nice to see. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so Madina, I, I will start my, my talk. So SDGs was set already um, uh, seven years ago in 2015 in response to the uh, global challenges we are facing in diverse contexts and also at the different levels. And they cover a quite wide range of issues, starting from violence, armed conflict, climate change, biodiversity loss, increasing uh, socioeconomic inequalities, youth unemployment, and also to rising intolerance. In order to achieve these goals, it is uh, evident that change uh, should be taking place uh, really urgently, and this is really imperative. And change in what terms? Change in terms of individual mindset and capacities, as well as the systems such as education, health, industry, and agriculture, and so on. And education for UNESCO especially, and I think you all agree, but it has a role to play in promoting this change whether delivered in schools, universities, or clubs, museums, at home or online. In 2017, UNESCO published a book which is called Education for Sustainable Development Goals, Learning Ob Objectives, sorry. We will put that uh, in, in discussion maybe, uh, Madina, if you could help uh, uh, to, to, to share this publication. UNESCO has compiled, uh, based on uh, relevant literature, we came up with a list of eight cross-cutting sustainability competencies, and they are all transversal, multifunctional, content independent, uh, and all key for achieving SDGs. So I hope you find your answer uh, among these eight, but of course it's not the exhaustive list. We think that they are really, really basic critical uh, competencies required for sustainability. Um, so just to maybe highlight some of them, because if I go on, I will speak up uh, um, <laughs> too long. Anticipatory competency, which is about the ability to understand and evaluate multiple future scenarios, possible, probable, and desirable ones, and to create one's own vision for the future, to apply the precautionary principle, to be able to assess the consequences of actions and of course to deal with risks and changes and collaboration which came back uh, quite um, many uh, among your answers 
This is about the ability to learn from others, to understand and respect the needs, perspectives, and actions of others, to understand, relate to, but also to be sensitive to others. So this is called often empathetic leadership, to deal with conflicts in a group and facilitate collaborative and participatory problem solving. This is just to highlight some of the uh, competencies. If we are interested in knowing more, please visit uh, the website uh, Elena uh, was referring to. Uh, finally, uh, UNESCO has been advocating the holistic approach to learning so that all learners can be active, creative, and responsible global citizens. Next slide, please. What does it mean? Uh, we believe we need to see among learners that development of, we can call it heads, heart, and also hands. What does it mean? So I come to that. Uh, addressing different dimensions of learning, which is cognitive, but also socio-emotional and behavioral dimensions. They all need to be addressed in teaching and learning in a holistic manner. So it's not enough only to talk about cognitive dimension of learning. Very, very important to address values and attitudes and behaviors. So the cognitive domain comprises, for example, knowledge and thinking skills that are all necessary to better understand the SDGs in this specific context and the challenges in achieving it. And the second dimension, the socio-emotional domain, uh, this includes social skills uh, that enable learners to collaborate, negotiate, and communicate to promote the SDGs, as well as self-reflection skills, values, and attitudes, and motivations, very, very important, uh, that helps learners to develop themselves. And finally, the behavioral domain means actually action competencies. So we really would like to see that all learners could be developed in this very holistic way, to have uh, uh, the, once again, heads, heart, and hands. This is the end of uh, my, my, my talk, and uh, I will take this back to Elena. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will move on to the uh, demo of the SDG fitness test that will be presented by my colleague, uh, Ms. Madina Imaraleva, Associate Program Officer at UNITAR. Thank you very much, Elena, uh, dear colleagues, dear uh, distinguished participants. It's a pleasure to be being here. So, um, so based on what has been uh, presented by my colleagues, uh, we at UNSDG Learn, together with the UNSDG Learn partners as UNESCO, UNDRR, and other colleagues, and together with the professors from the Arizona State University, we have developed an SDG fitness test that is developed around these eight cross-cutting competencies that are key to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals SDGs. And uh, these um, uh, cross-cutting competencies then are, are, are in line with these uh, three domains that has uh, been mentioned by uh, Drew. They are um, the cognitive, the knowledge level, emotion, social emotional uh, domain, and action, which is behavioral. So um, we have developed this um, short assessment uh, composed of 24 questions and they are developed around uh, four scenarios. There, um, the scenarios have been based on the real, um, uh, uh, real world uh, cases, um, such as SDG best practices, etc., that allows to immerse yourself in a real uh, um, uh, situation and be able to um, uh, um, uh, to test yourself how well you're doing, how well you're equipped with uh, these competences to be able to contribute to the uh, achievement of the SDGs. So let me now uh, go to the uh, platform itself to show the, the, the assessment. So as you can see, this is the UNS Digital Learn uh, platform. Maybe some of you already have checked it out. So um, um, let me make it smaller. This is the landing page of UNS Digital Learn. And uh, um, as Elena mentioned, you can find the learning uh, uh, that you're interested in based on courses, micro learning, um, uh, that you uh, would like to maybe follow a course, or maybe you would like to have some short bits such as micro learning. 
And uh, uh, the SDG fitness test is uh, available upon um, uh, registration. So one would need to go to here. I will I have already registered. So um, I will go, I will show you how the registration works. So you provide basic information. You provide the mental models that you belong to, sort of the personas um, that you uh, relate to. And the SDG areas that you're interested in. here, I um, tagged the cross-cutting areas and also uh, some of others. So basically you save the ch changes and you have uh, created the profile. Uh, once you're there, you go to your um, dashboard and on your dashboard, you will find this um, assessment uh, section. And you in there, you will find the SDG fitness test that we're talking about. Uh, you click here uh, and uh, 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 clicking here, you will be able to take the, the test. So let me quickly uh, retake the test. Um, so as mentioned, uh, there are 24 questions and there are four scenarios. Uh, uh, you can uh, start, uh, click here by starting a new attempt or if you're new uh, to the platform, you will just uh, start uh, from uh, fresh. So uh, there are short scenarios provided uh, and then uh, followed by a number of questions. So uh, let me uh, maybe uh, do the following. Uh, let me read out uh, uh, one of the scenarios and we'll try to attempt to uh, jointly answer the question and see how we're all doing on these um, competencies. So the scenario uh, that I will be sharing with you is around the um, uh, project. Uh, it's around the Enhanced Rural Resilience uh, Project. So let me uh, uh, read the, the scenario now. Several years ago, you founded a solar company that provides solar systems to businesses and households in the capital city. Recently, you read about an award-winning Enhanced Rural Resilience uh, Project that was implemented abroad and whose primary objective was to establish decentralized solar energy systems. But the program did more than just uh, seek to make solar energy accessible and affordable. It also focused on supporting women, improving employability skills, and more as part of the integrated program. You feel that your company could spark such an initiative in your own country. So now the following question. Um, is um, uh, related to one of the competencies, uh, um, one of the cross-cutting competencies. Let me read the, the question. The best opportunity to fund this project is a recently launched funding mechanism for a public-private partnership that seeks to simulate rural economic development. Your proposed uh, ERR-inspired project is a finalist, and you're invited to give a presentation to the award panel. During your presentation, you're getting skeptical looks and finally one of the panels say, I can see how micro solar power is a good thing, but I don't see how it would stimulate economic development. So there are a number of answer choices that you can um, select. Uh, uh, usually uh, two answer uh, choices are correct. Let me now uh, invite you all to participate in answering this um, question through the Mintimeter. So if you can uh, now log in to a Mintimeter using the same code, I will put it in the chat for, the, uh, for your quick reference. And we can answer this question together and we'll try to then um, drill it down on how uh, this competency, uh, what competency is being um, assessed. So I will wait five more seconds uh, to allow participants to join the mentee meta, and then we'll proceed. Okay, so let's go to the question. So the question is, what is, just a second, please. What is the feedback loop that connects micro solar power and economic development? So in a different uh, language, what is the relationship between the uh, um, micro solar panel, uh, power and the economic development? How two of them are connected? 
So the answer choices uh, uh, based on this scenario that I have read um, uh, to you, the microsolar and economic development loop is an example of balancing type of feedback loop, meaning that there is a, a, a balancing way of that um, uh, balancing relationship um, in these um, uh, two terms. Uh, the second one, stable solar electricity prices allow businesses, households make long-term financial plans and purchase more microsolar power, increasing solar energy and share. And the third one, enhancing women's livelihoods and bolstering carbon-free energy. Uh, the, set, the next one is project money will go directly to economic development as wages and the purchase of local supplies, um, thus supporting the economic development. Uh, another answer choice is higher diesel fuel prices will force residents to reduce electricity use, but solar microgrid can help fill uh, some of the gap thanks to the outside funding. And the last one, increased electricity from solar creates more jobs and purchases of solar systems, meaning more businesses, clinics, et cetera, can stay uh, open lo for longer hours. Here we see uh, more people voting for the second uh, answer choice. Um, stable solar electricity prices allow um, businesses and households make uh, um, uh, long-term financial plans uh, and also that increased electricity from solar creates more jobs and purchases of solar systems. Um, that is a good way of thinking. And uh, let me explain now uh, why is that. So let me. Yes, Adina, Elena? just to alert you that we don't have much time left. Um, I will try to be very quick. So if I now quickly show you how is that um, related, so how can solar power simulate economic development? So um, I think uh, not um, one of the answer choices was, well, it can ensure carbon free energy and support women, but how uh, does it relate to the economic development? So here you can see that uh, there are linkages uh, to the carbon free energy and women entrepreneurship from this uh, project on micro solar power, but then how we can find the loop on economic development. Uh, so uh, now let's, so in this case, yes, the people will not be convinced as there is no um, uh, obvious uh, linkage uh, feedback loop. If we go to another uh, choice that was mostly uh, voted, that is um, uh, correct, we can see that, yes, solar power can contribute to stable prices and long-term financial planning for businesses and households. Let me quickly um, demonstrate it how. So we can see that, uh, yes, project uh, on microsolar power, carbon-free energy uh, leads to the carbon-free energy. It in turn um, um, increases the share of solar energy in the energy mix, uh, which positively contributes to the stabilizing the uh, energy prices, which then uh, uh, in encourages more um, long-term financial planning for the households and businesses. And it, it creates um, more savings and consumption on the other side. And uh, it, it leads to the economic investment and to the growth of GDP and, uh, and the woman entrepreneurship also uh, positively uh, reacts to this and then um, uh, positively contributes to the GDP and economic investment and brings back to as a positive loop uh, um, to the uh, project of microsolar power. So here you can see there is a loop. So this is, uh, um, as you can see, uh, this was the question related to system thinking competencies. So we don't have to uh, think in a linear way, but we have to put us, ourselves in a system thinking lenses and to try to analyze the situation from different aspects and how one of the um, uh, actions can contribute to another and sort of have a, uh, um, uh, either negative or positive effect. So uh, this, this was a short um, uh, preview of the questions. Based on the, um, once you finish the result, uh, the, the test, uh, 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 once you answer to uh, all of the 24 questions, you will receive your personalized um, uh, score. 
and you will be able to see on how well you're doing on each of the competencies and on what level, whether introductory, intermediate, and advanced, uh, and also across the learning domains. Uh, based on these results, then uh, the platform will suggest a um, uh, uh, number of courses and micro learning bits to be uh, that will help you to polish up these competencies and um, uh, uh, improve your knowledge and skills. Uh, so, for in order to keep track of what you're learning, um, the platform allows to build your own learning pathway. So, here, for example, uh, I would like to take a course on SDG line budgeting. And I can put it in my learning uh, pathway. Go here, and I can see that I I, uh, I have included in my learning pathway in my list. And I can go to the uh, course uh, provider's uh, web page and take the course and come back and complete um, uh, market as a complete. So basically, uh, this platform will allow you to um, assess your uh, knowledge and skills. Uh, around these co competencies and be able to help you even further to improve uh, and um, uh, um, polish up these uh, competencies. We have one minute left before the end of the session. Just a second. Um, sorry. So um, I will not go through the, um, the um, I will just put the link to of the uh, UNS Digital Learn website uh on the chat box so uh chat box uh so participants can register just wanted to quickly mention another um um uh, innovative tool that was uh developed by our colleagues at the uh, unit uh, uh as part of the uncc learn uh initiative they have developed a climate change iq test that allows you to test your knowledge around uh, climate change that is uh, very important and um here you can find the URL and the, the steps on how to take the, um, the test. Uh, we will uh, be, uh, this information will be shared also uh, then later with the participants. So I invite you all to check this um, um, quizzes, assessments and test yourself and uh, improve your knowledge and skills uh, on uh, SDG competencies and uh, overall climate change. I stop here, Elena. Thank you very much. And uh, also for those uh, who are interested, uh, there is a competition for innovation teams interested in contributing to producing data and innovation for SDGs. This year with a focus on SDG 13 and 16. Uh, so please feel free to uh, also check it out or um, disseminate also maybe among your students and other persons who are interested in participating in that. And I think we've arrived at the end of our session. Um, so uh, there had been a few questions and answers um, uh, that were posted uh, in the questions and answers block. And I've seen that most of them had been addressed. I would like now to thank all the participants uh, for being with us today, for your great interest and being active online in the chat. There had been a lot of exchanges and contacts made as we could uh, see. And also to thank all the presenters and panelists for your active uh, participation and um, uh, thoughtful contributions today. Thank you very much to everyone. Lina, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.